Before we get started, just a reminder that you can find all of my available rental properties on my website at markguzman.com. If you own investment property, click on the owner services section to see our complete list of services. This episode is brought to you by Baniked Commercial Real Estate. There's more to building wealth in real estate than simply buying and holding. You need to have an entry and exit strategy. You need to know when to invest, have a plan to maximize return during the holding period, and have an exit strategy to sell and exchange the property into a bigger investment. This takes a set of highly qualified professionals to guide you from buying your first investment property to eventually upgrading to the 100-unit complex providing wealth for you and your family. Brian Baniked and David Peel have over 35 years of combined experience specializing in helping families build wealth through real estate. They assist you in putting your investment on autopilot and will guide you along each exchange. Visit them at www.bcre.co. Again, that's www.bcre.co to give your future a jumpstart. This week on Highest and Best, we welcome back Ron Mintz, Vice President of Golden Gate Sotheby's International Realty. A former president with the Contra Costa Association of Realtors, Ron manages over 200 employees across several offices. Today, we get his take on the slowing housing market and how his agents are dealing with the slowdown and what the next year could look like for real estate in the Bay Area. So, cool. great. Um, Ron, yeah. thanks for coming out to the podcast again. Is this your third this is my time? second time. Second time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of it's course. Awesome. I feel like you've been on it more times, but just two times? This is my second time. Yeah. I've only sat in this chair once. And then one time uh, at one my time old? one time at the other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so welcome to the new studio here. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we have plans to build out. Um, some more office space here in the back. And then that's where we're going to move our management office, real estate office, and we're going to have a professional podcast room. Oh, how fantastic. Yeah, so I'm excited for that. So that'll be coming up uh, here very soon. It's amazing how many people I run into that, you know, when I'm interviewing, especially new recruits, and they'll go, oh, I heard your podcast. And I'm like, oh, my God, you're kidding. You heard my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, people seem to, to like it. So that's a good thing. Yeah, you, and that's one thing that – that made me really want to focus on doing a podcast for marketing is that it's a pri- it's evergreen content it's mm-hmm. there online forever mm-hmm. you know unless you take it down and it's amazing how many people will research you research the company right. and try to find out who you are and if there's a piece of content like a video or a podcast where they can learn a little bit more about who you are right. your way of thinking especially if they're coming to interview to uh, work for your company. Yeah. Oh, right? yeah. It's been extremely helpful. There's no question. And and it puts a voice or, you know, kind of a face to who you're going to meet. And and like you said, it gives you an introduction that you wouldn't have otherwise had mm-hmm. if it's just black and white on paper. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's awesome that they listen to the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. How, do you have, I mean, you, you must have um, statistics of how many people are tuned in and um we do but podcasting is a little different it, it's still in the very early baby stages okay. when it comes to data and statistics because it only well you have itunes historically that's never released the data right that's problem number one right apple keeps all the data for right. themselves they're little by little starting to roll out data and allowing other platforms like libsyn or podbean soundcloud that syndicate to itunes to allow them to get some of that data, but it's still not 100%. Okay. And then with podcasts, you can only track downloads. Oh, okay. So not people that actually just listen online? Or do you have to download it and even to do that? I only listen to it through my podcast app. Yeah. So. And, and so they're streaming a podcast app, right? And I'm not sure how that counts as a download. Okay. And then there's an actual download where someone clicks download, right. it downloads to your device, right. and then it plays from the device. Um, I do a little bit of both. Like me personally, I will download certain podcasts I want to listen to later, right. especially if I'm going to be on the road, right. yeah, on a road lack of reception, or something. Yeah, exactly. yeah, something like that. But then other times, if I'm on Wi-Fi, I, I just go ahead and stream it. I don't even bother downloading it to... Yeah, and it's strange. You don't get that... Statistical information as to how many no, people are listening to your podcast. No, and, and there's a few tech companies that are trying to develop technology to really track that. Right. But right now it's very basic. Wow. So, okay. so you get an idea of what your downloads are, but many times, like, 
and especially with a lot of podcasts, your downloads, I think, are they, the data and statistics, I think, are much lower than what people actually listen to. Because when you start really looking for feedback online or in person from people, you start to realize how many people really listen to it, right? Right. People start saying, oh, I listened to this one. And they're referencing very specific parts of a podcast or very specific episodes. And typically that happens because you have some sort of listening base. Right. Right. And and sometimes the data doesn't really match up to that. So I think there's more listeners than what the data shows right now. Okay. So well, we hope. Which, which is good. Yeah. yeah. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. Plus, I tell people – um, cause we've talked to a few like real estate agents and companies about starting their own podcast and they get stuck on, well, am I going to have a thousand listeners? Am I going to have 10,000 right. listeners? That sort of thing. And I'm like, you know, if you have 10 know. or 20, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, if one of them does business with you, it pays for itself because podcasting, you can do relatively cheap. cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I enjoy this. So thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the market. We were just going to get into this right mm -hmm. before we started to hit record. And me doing property management, I don't see a lot of the various housing trends anymore. For me, it's it's a completely different world. So with you managing uh, a couple <clears throat> offices, many agents, what are you seeing right now with the housing market? I do remember in July, it began to slow down. Yeah, so, actually, towards the end of May, it really took a dive. Um, it picked up a little in June, and then in July, after the 4th of July, we really saw another sort of downturn. Um, right now, things are slow. There's definitely increased inventory, but it's inventory of unsold homes, not necessarily inventory of new homes coming on the market. Um, so like on tour days, we're seeing a lot more repeats of homes that are being open for tour, mm -hmm. um, rather than new homes hitting the market. Okay. Usually so in January, we expect an increase. Um, not really seeing that as much. So these time. would be homes that were taken off the market and then relisted back on. Or even homes that had just continued to stay on the market. And now they're trying, the brokers or agents are trying to reintroduce them to the, to the public or get some new energy into the homes or um, we're seeing, you know, price reductions for the first time in a long time. Uh, my personal view of what's happening in the market is we are at that point where there needs to be some re-education of buyers and sellers. You know, there, it had been a buyer's market for, uh, um, uh, I mean, a seller's market for quite a long time. And um, it, it, it's, it, Sellers put their homes on the markets thinking they're going to get this outrageous price based on what the market used to be. And it's up to us as agents to educate them as to where the market is today. The reason why I say we're in an education period is because we're not at the point yet where sellers are believing what agents are telling them. They were still at the point where sellers think they know everything and they're thinking <laughs> that, oh, let's just put the home on the market at this price. It'll happen because that's what happened before. Um, so I, I think we're in this kind of 90 days, it, usually what it has been in the past, 90 day period where people need to understand what's happening in the market and actually believe it. And once sellers start understanding that they can't just arbitrarily put a price on their home and it'll sell, and then buyers understand that they do have some negotiation ability, um, we will see more of a regular market. But I still think we're a little, a little ways off on that. Things are... You know, there are more homes on the market. There are homes staying on the market longer. We're seeing a lot more price adjustments, which we hadn't seen in a long time. Um, how, how, how do you educate property owners about the housing market? Because the one thing I've noticed in just talking to a lot of people just in my circle of uh, family, friends, is that a lot of people don't keep up with the housing market. Right. And then they – they come to you with the idea of, oh, I'm going to get 30 offers because right. I heard my buddy got exactly. it or I see – I saw – I read a Zillow article a year ago and there's a ton of multiple offers. So right. I want 30 offers. That's why. I mean you've just basically stated why I think we are in an education sort of arena right now. We, you know, sellers need to be educated and it's up to the, to the agents 
to educate them as to what's going on. And, and the beauty about real estate is there's so many statistics available that all you need to do is bring in the data to support what you're saying. Now, that sounds really great that when you bring in that data, it will definitely support the agent's point of view that things have slowed down a little. But when I, again, emphasize this sort of educational area arena, the sellers are not believing it yet. They haven't heard from their friend that things have changed. <laughs> so once that word starts getting spread around and sellers start hearing not only what the agents are telling them, but what their friends are telling them, then we'll start seeing a more sort of normal market for lack of a better way of saying it. Okay. So key number one in getting the right price when you're interviewing, getting the listing is to find out who their friend is and get the friend to call them and but tell them. That would them. be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that is a great strategy. If you can do that. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. Uh, <laughs> Facebook, find yeah, out well, who their closest <laughs> friends are. <laughs> yeah, but then you also have to convince the friends because the friends are not necessarily believing what's happening in the market. Exactly. It's a because much broader they, problem. Exactly, just, because they so. got the 30 offers. Exactly, exactly. And the thing is, it's so recent. Like two months ago, they got 30 offers. And now two months later, that market has changed completely. So those 30 offers are not available. So it takes time mentally to adapt to that. And I think we're in that, that phase right now where you know people need to adapt to the changing market and then react to what has changed in the marketplace. Yeah, I was a little shocked and surprised how fast it changed back in uh, really summertime last yeah. year in 2018, just how quickly it shifted. And it was a big shock. I, I had a condo listed on the market in Emeryville where we saw a closing happened near 800,000. Mm -hmm. And then two months later, like literally two months later, another identical unit closed for $80,000 less. Right. Well, I mean, there's look, there are other market factors that we haven't even touched on, and that is increasing interest rates. Um, you know, the affordability index is through the roof, so people can't really afford things. And when interest rates go up, it just means that they become even less affordable. So that had an effect on that, too. Interest rates did shoot up a little in the summer. Um, we've had a dip, though, lately. Yeah, we've definitely had a dip because of the fluctuations in the stock market. Um, but... <laughs> Again, <laughs> interest rates used to be under 4%. Now, I, don't, I mean, you know, I've been in this business for a long time. 4% is like a, a gift from God that you can get an interest rate that low. Usually, a, a regular sort of normal market is around 6%. We haven't seen that in over a decade. Um, so it's going to be hard to swallow that that is okay still to have that high of an interest rate but again, in California, our prices are so outrageous that there's got to be a more realistic approach to what you're going to sell your home for. It can't be, I'm going to shoot for this guy, get 30 offers. It, it's just not going to happen. You need to really understand what your home is worth. Do the research. You know, good agents are doing a lot of research and providing a lot of data about it. But the seller needs to understand it, and they're not there yet. And it's about properly preparing your home for sale, oh. too. The days of just listing it as is and, again, getting 30 offers, is, right. it, they're long gone now. So you really have to uh, make sure everything's in working order, stage it, get repairs done, maybe finish up upgrades, yeah, everything, that's right? That's actual change in the market that I've seen over the last five years is that buyers are no longer uh, visionary. They, they can't walk into a home, or, or they choose not to, I don't want to say can't, but they, they walk into a home and they can't visualize what the home can be. Somehow that's been lost. I don't know why. Well, so, you know, I, I experienced that even when I first started in real estate in 2003 because, I, you know, when you start real estate, you're always representing buyers, right? right? right. Whoever you can get. Right. And I remember there were times where we were – I was showing them a home that might have had the ugly shag carpet, right? right? Exactly. And then it, it's telling them, "Hey, for two thousand dollars, you can have this room uh, replaced." And they couldn't, they couldn't imagine it. And they decided to go off and pay twenty, thirty, forty thousand more for another house. Exactly. That was completely done. Correct. Because they just lacked that vision. That's that has always been 
a, an issue, but it seems to be a little more prominent today. So homes that need, it, it's, you know, strange dynamic, homes that need to be completely sort of almost torn down are selling like there's no tomorrow. And homes that are completely done, you know, with everything that you could possibly want are selling as well. Those homes in the middle are not really moving that quickly. Um, and, and that's, again, just indicative of what's happening in the marketplace, you know, educating and pricing things correctly. And, um, buyers still have attitude like they could just, you know, it, buyers have been on the fence for a long time now because of prices and how quickly, you know, things they would been, they were very disappointed about how many offers they had to write and how many homes they didn't get. Um, they kind of stopped. They're just like, we're done. We're not going to move anymore. Um, and that's having an effect on the market as well. So they need to slowly come back and realize inventory has increased. I, and, see, I see that on the property management side when someone shows up to apply for an apartment rental and they have a lender pre-approval letter. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Does that matter to you that they have a lender pre-approval letter? It's extra documentation that helps. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but buyers need to understand this. Since there's more inventory, they can take a little more control. You know, they could... Another dynamic that changed recently over the years is buyers are not willing to write offers for what they want to pay for a home. They they will not write an offer at all rather than write a lowball offer, which is bizarre. Yeah. Because why not write an offer and see if you can negotiate something, but they're not willing to do it. They're like, oh, no, that home still is off by a hundred grand. I'll wait until they reduce the price. Why not just write an offer? See yeah, exactly. what you can do. They're not willing to do that. It's it's bizarre. That's one thing that's always fascinated me because I would rather find out if it's a no than to not know at all. Exactly. Or take a chance. You might hit a seller on a day where something happened to them and they're like, you know, we need to get out of this place. We're, we've been on the market for 30 days now. We need to see an offer. Let's get something so we can work with it. Why not be the buyer that can do that? Prices are still a little out of whack. And if buyers understood, they can write an offer for a little less than what the property is listed, provided you're still within you know reality, um, they might get the house. And I, I don't understand. Agents are having problems convincing their clients to take that chance. I don't know if it's feelings, like they're gonna, they, they feel like they're gonna insult the seller if they write an offer for less. I don't know what it is, but they need to get over that. I know a few buyers that are sitting on the sideline, and I think part of the reason, uh, and this is not, a, I'm not saying this is the exact reason for every buyer, but I know with some of these buyers, one of the reasons is the 2008 crash. They're thinking, oh, if prices drop again, even if I buy it for 100000 less, well, then a year later, it's going to be worth 100000 less. And in their mind, they're like, Oh, what what if I can buy this for two hundred thousand less, right? Well, that's not gonna happen. But for some of buy some of the buyers on the sideline, it seems as if that kind of plays a major decision factor in their mind as to, well, we saw what happened in two thousand eight. Right. It may drop a little bit more. I might as well just wait until they keep reducing that, and then make an offer. And that is exactly what's happening. And it's interesting because if a buyer, you get that rare buyer who is willing to take a chance, if they write an offer for $100,000 less and they end up getting the house, first words out of their mouth is, oh, I still think I overpaid because mm -hmm. they accepted my offer for $100,000 less. Um, you're right. I mean, people are still keeping that, that time frame in their minds about what happened in the market at that time not realizing that we are in a completely different economy, different sort of structure than we were back then. You know, there are there are starting to be a little more of those funny loans that are coming back, but they're not as prominent as they used to be. And the fact that you can pay for your home, um, I, and I, I'm sorry, buyers need buyers need to qualify now for their homes. You need to show that they actually have the ability to pay a loan back, unlike the days back in 2008. So we're in a different dynamic. The, the market is not going to crash 
the same way that it crashed back then. The reason it crashed back then is because of all the funny mortgages that happened. We don't have all those funny mortgages anymore. We have regular mortgages. Foreclosures are way down now. Um, you know, people, and we can get into a whole conversation about there's no incentive in California to actually sell your house at this point, and that's a whole another conversation. But people can afford where they are, and in California especially, there has never been a time where you have not seen actual increases in property value over the long term, regardless if you're underwater at any given time in that you know, time frame. It's like the stock market. You know, things fluctuate. They go up, they go down. Home, you know, real estate, because it's it, there's a finite resource. I mean, you, you only have so much. There is no way that real estate's not going to continue to 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 go up at some point, even if it falls. Especially when you have a, a deficit right. that we have here in California. Exactly. And that's, you know, again, we can get into the whole politics of what's going on as well, which is affecting the housing market. So the government shutdown. Yeah. One of the one of the issues, um, I, I think it was the New York Times that came out and they said that there's about four hundred and eighty three million dollars in monthly mortgages and rental payments that the government workers that are not getting paid are now are facing for make. they're not gonna make these payments. Exactly. So are you seeing with your agents any issues with the government shutdown? Because one of the issues in real estate is uh, uh, income verification from the IRS. Correct. That's the, that is the only um, result that we're seeing right now or the only impact that we're seeing right now. Um, loans are delayed and there's just no, no way to go around that. The IRS is not dealing with the whatever the form that is, 40, 5, 60, or whatever that yeah. form is, um, they're, they're not sending the information to lenders, so lenders cannot move forward with loans. So that is a delay. What percentage of transactions are you seeing this on? I, right now, it's like 1%. I haven't seen a huge um, influx, but it, again, it depends on your the, the price range that you're dealing with and the type of loans people are getting. Um, you know, when you deal, I work for a luxury real estate brand. Uh, when you deal in a higher price range, you're dealing with less reliance on those types of programs. So, you know, we're not seeing a, a huge impact, but it's happening. You know, you start having agents that are selling homes in Concord and Martinez and parts of Walnut Creek and Danville and San Ramon. You know, th those people rely on these government type loans to, to purchase homes. We're going to see more. If the government doesn't open, hmm. more delays. Now, with the market doing what it's doing right now, how do you educate your agents to adapt to this? Because it, it's hard for sellers and buyers to adapt to the right. market. Do you <clears throat> see your agents adapting as quickly or as slowly as buyers and sellers, or you see them adapting faster? And then how do you get them ahead of the curve so that – they can properly educate and guide their clients. Well, so what I try to do is educate my agents, right? So you take all of the information that's out there. Uh, I have a biweekly office meeting where agents come in and even agents that can't make it, I have notes that are taken and then sent out to all my agents. Um, what I try to do is educate them as to what's going on. I also have a lender that comes in and talks about what's going on in the marketplace. So if the agents are prepared with the information, um, all they need to do is study it and learn it so that they can spit it out to their clients. And that's what really I try to do is to give them that information, that tool to be able to go and explain it to their clients and educate them. Um, it, it, again, and I said this earlier, sellers are, not, are reluctant to believe you, but you have to consistently have that information available and give them updated data you know, almost daily about what's happening in the market so that they understand, you know, that home has been sitting on the market for 30 days. Why? Let's look at it. Why is that sitting on the market? Um, and agents are, for the most part, they soak up that stuff. They, you know, they're like a sponge. They love hearing about what's happening in the real estate market and they love having that information so they could be ahead of the curve 
when they go meet with their clients. You know, it, it's funny. Uh, that reminded me of uh, one thing that a lot of sellers do that also property owners of rental properties do, and I deal with it all the time. <clears throat> they look at what's on the market and say, oh, yeah, my home's worth this much. Right. Well, yep. no, not necessarily. This is on the market. It's still available. I mean, there could be other factors, and it might be worth that much. It might be worth more. Your home might be worth less, even though that home might be worth more. There's a lot of factors you have to look Oh yeah. Look at, but a lot of people tend to just look at like the Zillow map or whatever's available, Redfin, and they see what's available, and they just make a guess and say, that's what my property's worth. Well, what drives me crazy is the focus on price per square foot. That mm, drives yeah. me nuts because you could have two exact same houses right next to each other and the price per square foot will be different based on the condition of that home. And sellers really have a hard time comprehending that. And exactly like you said, they walk around going, oh, yeah, my home's worth that because this home sold for $400 a square foot. I should be able to sell mine for 400 a square foot. Well, no, you need a new kitchen. You need a new bathroom. Your carpet's 20 years old. Your backyard is overgrown. You know, it's going to take some money to bring your home back up to what that home, the condition that home is in. They don't comprehend that. That's, mm -hmm. a, again, an education process, and they don't want to hear it because nobody likes to hear about how their home needs things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and then you get the sellers who are willing to do anything. And then they look at their home after you're done and they're like, oh, my God, why didn't I do this before? <laughs> I should have had this home all up and, you know, so I could live in it. Now it looks amazing. I wish I could buy it again. <laughs> um, so it, it's interesting how that works. But you're right. They focus on one thing. They think they're right. They don't listen to anybody else. They put themselves into a box and it's really hard for them to get out. Um, and it just requires information and kind of lifting the lid and pulling them slowly but surely out of that box so they know. When it comes to agent education, if an agent is interested in learning more about the industry, tracking economic trends that really affect their own business or even the local market, where do you recommend that they start? Well, the, the beauty of our industry is, again, they have all of this data and statistical information available to anybody who wants it, easy locations. And we are fortunate enough to have uh, associations that actually compile all of this data and make it available to their to their members. So you can go to NAR for a national sort of, and you, they also narrow down to a regional, but you can go for national data. You can go to CAR, the California Association, and get some data from them. Or you can go down all the way to the local uh, association of realtors that has easy to pull data easily understood in a format that's easily presented as well um, that that's available yeah california great. association of realtors creates a lot of infographics and videos mm -hmm. that you can simply share with clients exactly nar has you know economic uh videos their, their economist um does videos periodically that that are just available you can send them out they're um they're very easy to understand also, they're not using language that, you know, consumers won't understand. They're very simple. Yeah. So I'm pulling out my phone because I do want to bring up this. Have you listened to the podcast by CAR? No. It's called Housing Matters Podcast. Okay. It's a really good podcast. Okay. If you really want to nerd out on housing statistics and what's going on with economic trends in California, great podcast to listen to. Who does it? Um, let's see. I believe it's a person right underneath Leslie Appleton Young. Oh, okay. So it's not Leslie directly. No, it's, it's not Leslie. Leslie. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't remember his name. Let's see. It starts with a J. Or... No, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. I, I was more looking to see if it was Leslie that was putting it out. So. Yeah, no, it, no. It, it'd be very interesting to hear a podcast by her and everything that she has access to and is really looking at. Oh, I saw a recent presentation from her. I think you were there at CAR. Yeah, at the conference, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because Leslie is one of those people that just stands up and says, look, I'm going to tell you what's happening in the marketplace. It could be totally wrong, though. Um, and then she just starts giving the, the data, but then, you know, visits it a year later 
and actually picks out where they were wrong, which a lot of economists don't do. Mm -hmm. um, she's yeah, she's phenomenal. Yeah, that's one thing that I find very interesting with a lot of economists is that. 50% say one thing, 50% say another thing. Like everyone's predicting 2019, well, half economists are predicting 2019 is going to be a slow year with a recession going in 2020. Right. Then you have a few other economists that are saying, no, we're still going to have a, 2000, a strong 2019. We might have a slow 2020, but they don't see a recession happening. Yeah, I, I, we're past due. I mean, any economist will tell you we're way past due for a for a change in the economy. The the difference. There's so many things happening in the economy right now. I mean, the economy is extremely strong. You know, unemployment, which is always a driving factor uh, regarding housing. If you have a if you feel comfortable in your job, chances are you're going to feel comfortable buying a home. It's like three point four or three point five right now, isn't it? Unemployment. Unemployment. Right? Uh, I heard three point nine, but it went down on this latest report, so I don't know what that number is. Yeah, but we're almost at full employment. Yeah. I mean, it's basically, and in California, we are in a deficit, so we need more people to fill jobs than we have available. So, mm -hmm. um, but it, <laughs> this, the the uncertainty that's happening on a government level has really created lack of confidence in making these decisions right now. Um, nobody knows where things are going to be, so therefore they don't want to make decisions because they're uncertain. It's never, and Leslie pointed this out in her presentation as well, there's always a tie between employment rates and housing. This is the first time she has ever seen where we have an unbelievably strong fundament, fundamental economy and it's not translating in increase in housing purchases. No one knows why, but that's happening. And I believe it's just due to the overall uncertainty about anything at this point. You have, you know, regardless of your political affiliation, it doesn't matter. But when you have a president who is tweeting policy there, it doesn't give you a lot of confidence about what the future holds. For Especially us. when he tweets uh, what he wants to do and then you've got the vice president or someone in his cabinet tweeting out, yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> right. right. Um, and I, again, I don't want to get into a political discussion about, you know, whether you're a Republican or Democrat. It doesn't matter. The, the fact of the matter is we have a government that is not working. Well, there's also the 2008 financial crash that I think um, a lot of people – I don't think a lot of people realize how much that's going to have a lasting impact for many of the future years because you had this really completely complicated financial system that came down on itself because of the way CDOs and and insurance and everything was just packaged together and sold mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, an extreme correction after that with government policy coming in. I mean, just look at the Frank Dodd Act. Right. I mean, they could only enforce like 50 percent of all the right. rules because it but was it's just a too pendulum. much. We, we have this all the time. You know, the pendulum swings way far out and it gets destroyed and has to swing back. And the, and the only way to compensate for what happened in the downturn was to create all of these regulations and go you know, hard ass out there, you know, creating as many regulations as you possibly can. And then you learn over time that some of those have to be adjusted so that the pendulum can swing in the middle. And and I think that's where we're at right now right. because now we're seeing the effect of the housing market decoupled from the overall economy. And now I think everyone – there's been a few economists that say we haven't seen this before and we don't know what's going to happen. Exactly. That, that, and that's the scary thing, and that creates uncertainty. When you have uncertainty, you have people that don't want to make decisions. Even though all the reports say consumer confidence is high, I don't think they're asking the right questions. Consumer confidence may be high in the fact that, yeah, I will be able to go to my job tomorrow and have that. But I don't think it's confident enough to say, oh, yeah, but a long-term investment is something I need to make right now. No, it's mm. – I'm going to hold off. I need to keep a little cash. Well, you know, one of the things that many people forget about unemployment rate is that they 
they drop off the numbers of people that end up stops stop right. looking for uh, for work, or if they end up with um, with multiple <clears throat> jobs, they may not have a full time job, right. but they may end up with two or three or f- even four part time jobs, and all of a sudden they're considered full time employed, and then they're not part of the unemployment number, and so and so if you end up going from let's say 2007 having one full-time job and now you're even though unemployment rates really low but if you have two part-time or three part-time jobs you may not be as confident in the, True. in your stability and then at that point like what you said well that person may not feel comfortable even though they might be making as much money as before right. they don't feel comfortable making a long-term purchase or investment because they just don't know right. if they lose one of those jobs it changes their entire life correct and that's you know that that gets into the whole conversation about the cost of living in California you want to you want to segue into <laughs> what's happening um California is a very unique little economy it is the fifth largest economy in the world um and the cost of living here is beyond reason. It just makes no sense why things are so expensive here in California. But they can be. I guess that's the only reason. You know, it's like they can't be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went skiing over the weekend and, you know, lift ticket prices are through the roof. And we had some visitors from uh, out of the country who were with us. And they're like, why are lift prices so high? And you just look at them and go, well, because they can. Yeah, look around. Everyone's it. paying that. They can, period. But that's California. What was the uh, the company that bought Northstar? Is it Vail? Vail. Vail? Vail Corporation, yeah. Once they bought it, and I forgot, they bought it some eight years ago or something uh-huh. like that. I remember because I would go to Northstar all the time, and I would get a season pass at Northstar and be up there almost every weekend. And a season pass, I want to say, was under 200 bucks. Yeah. Th- it, when we bought season passes, they were 340 um, and that was, well, let's see, my daughter's 25, so figure 15 years ago. Yeah, I want to say they're like six, 800 bucks. They're something. over a thousand. They're over a thousand? Yeah, they're over a thousand. Oh my now, God. For a season pass. Uh, a lift ticket, a single day lift ticket is 170 bucks. If you buy it online, it's $153. You're kidding. No. Wow. Yeah. So. So when you Boreal must have, be booming. <laughs> I don't know what they charge at other resorts. I was just at North Star though. Boreal, uh, I went there. That's actually where I learned to snowboard. But you could get lift tickets for twenty bucks. Right? Isn't I mean though? God, when I started skiing, it was something that you could do. I mean, I, I was a high school student and I could afford to go every weekend and go skiing because it was twenty twenty five bucks. Um, no, those days are long gone. Yeah, and a family of four is spending eight hundred bucks on lift tickets. Yeah, exactly. For one day, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, but it feels like ever since Vail uh, Vail Resorts <clears throat> bought Northstar, that price has just skyrocketed. But they made a great investment. They bought it knowing that people would pay for it. Right. And and you know, it, it, again, these people who are from out of the country, they ski in other countries, and they're like, you go to France or. Um, you know, wherever, I mean, outside in Europe, lift prices are, I mean, lift ticket prices are less than half of what they are here. Hmm. Um, and it's just because they can't. There, there's really no other reason. There's that much money here that people will just pay it. Yeah, that's amazing. Do you think Gavin Newsom, as a new governor, will be able to meet his goal of 500,000 new construction units per year? No. <laughs> I don't. Um, unless he implements some changes to CEQA, which I'm sure people are familiar with, there's no way that that will happen. Well, you know, <coughs> a lot of people are not familiar with CEQA, but when I start to explain to them how someone can anonymously right. sue a development and stop the development, and the developer may never find out who this person is or this corporation is, all of a sudden... People are like, really? You can do that? Yeah. And a lot of people don't know. Yeah. I I went to a presentation at the last car conference with um, a uh, a person who's very uh, you know in involved with new developers and and the process, and they walked us through a project from Livermore. I, I don't know if you were at that presentation. No, I wasn't. But, um, so there's a development in Livermore 
that that has I mean, it's it's a, a development that's going on for a long time, but he walked through the process that it took for them to get to the point they're at today. And basically, from the time they purchased the land and started planning how they were going to develop the, the property, 15 years in order to start the first shovel in the ground to get things going. Wow. Because of yeah, CEQA, because of a lot of regulations that exist in California, and because of a salamander that exists in an adjacent property that may every once in a while walk into this property, it held up 15 years. So can you imagine being a developer, having money tied up in buying a piece of property, having money tied up in planning the development, going through the entire process, going through the permit process, then getting sued and having to deal with all of that before you make dime one, before you can even put wood up for framing. Yeah, you're not making a you're single not. profit or dime until you sell those properties. That's correct. So they have their money tied up. No wonder why they don't want to build. It just doesn't make sense. Or no wonder why they're, they've are they changed the dynamic now. New home developers build to suit now. They don't build like developments and say, okay, we're going to sell. They, they want to have buyers in hand before they start buying, I mean, before they start building homes. It's, it's weird. Um, that's got to change, and I, there's no way, unless Gavin Newsom is able to have some sort of emergency order or something, um, it's going to be a while before he can start saying that we're going to build a lot more homes. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how his term as governor is going to play out with also the uh, Democratic Party here in the state because <clears throat> the Democratic Party came out in support of Prop 10. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was the ban the Casa Hawkins, yet he came out and said he was against it. So he went against his own party in in that regard. And it's going to be very interesting to see if he sticks to that or if he uh, flip-flops. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see. I, he's a very strong-minded person who I believe has incredible intentions about what he wants to do. Um, he's a, He's... It, just reading reports and things, he's still a little naive about how things actually get done. Yeah, there's a lot of people criticizing him yeah. already, and he hasn't really— No, he hasn't done anything other <laughs> yeah. than he, now he's in a fight with the president. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, which California definitely needs more focus on the housing crisis here. I think he will provide that focus, um, which is a great thing overall, but it— but setting these goals, I, I, I don't think they're obtainable. No, no way, 500,000 homes. We'll be lucky to build 100,000. I mean, it, you know, we build, what, 80,000 80, homes? Um, just to make that small leap of 20,000 more, I think is going to be very challenging to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping his goal of 500,000 is just really a statement. And like right. what you said, just exactly. to put housing as a main focus. Right. And even if we get to 100,000 or 120, 150 per year, I mean, 160 would be double hey, of what we're 81, doing. 81,000 homes a year, you know, just slowly yeah. go up incrementally, whatever that increment is. If we can see progress being made on that front, it'll be an incredible long-term success. Um, yeah, and, and the demand just – or. What we have to build to keep up with the demand here in California is 180,000 units per year. Right. I mean, and we're I guess 10 years thing, behind on that. Yeah. So. The good thing for property owners <clears throat> overall in the long term is as long as we're building less, there's always going to be enough demand to where prices, real estate prices are going to continue to go up. Right. And that's it why just, I say there's no, there shouldn't be a worry if we hit a recession, for example, and there's some, you know, fluctuation in values. There shouldn't necessarily be a worry on the consumer standpoint that the housing market's going to collapse. I, I, I just don't believe that that's going to be the problem. Um, they just stick it through. You know, if their home went down 100 grand and they're underwater, make the payments. That's going to go up. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's just there's no way it can't if you apply basic economic um, supply and demand. Yeah. I mean, supply and demand. There, there's just no way that that's not going to go up eventually. So, um, but I mean, Gavin Newsom, we definitely are holding out some hope that things are going to 
be looked at a little differently than they had been. You know, uh, Governor Brown took us out of a huge crisis that we had in California and and left the state in a pretty good condition. Um, so this gives Gavin Newsom a chance to not have to dig out of a hole. He can start flat and hopefully build some good things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to require some regulation changes. There's no question about it. Uh, and as you said, just just identifying who's suing you could be extremely beneficial because um, it will stop a lot of these lawsuits. I wonder how many of those those sequel lawsuits are also competitors that want to stop a Nobody developer. Knows. Yeah. Exactly. Nobody knows. Yeah, oh, just or, you know, it could be somebody who woke up in the morning and said, "Oh, I read this article that uh, you know uh, this housing company. I don't like them, so I'm just going to." you know, prevent them from building. It could be that simple. Yeah. That you, that's all you need to do with CEQA is just have a great, uh, 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 um, a disagreement or have a gripe with somebody and you can cause their entire development be, to be delayed for years. So before we finish and close out this podcast, yeah. what's your prediction overall for real estate in 2019? Um, I think it's going to be very similar to 2018. I think there's going to, uh, again, I go back to what I started with, with this education process. I think once sellers understand what's happening in the market and they actually believe it, we're going to see that steadiness in the market. I don't think we're going to see a collapse. I don't think we're going to see uh, an acceleration. I think it's going to be a steady, probably 3 to 5% gain this year. And when I say three to five percent, it's probably going to end up at ten, but three to five percent gain in prices, and um, I think the number of transactions are going to continue to be lower than what they had been in years past, but very similar to what occurred in two thousand eighteen. Okay, yeah. for an agent that's interested in getting into the business, don't. I, I think <laughs> don't yeah, <laughs> no, I, I think it's really important for them to find a mentor, find a manager, find a brokerage that can provide that kind of insight that you provided today on past episodes and <coughs> someone that's also involved in, like, in the industry. You've been heavily involved in uh, local state uh, associations. You were the president just a few years ago with our local Contra Costa Association of Realtors. So I think for new agents coming in, it's very important for them to really look toward people that can guide them in the right direction and help them be prepared. And that's one of the biggest reasons why agents fail in the first two years is because they're not properly prepared. Well, they guided. don't look at that as a, as a real business. That's another factor. Yeah, yeah for sure. So, so um, I, I think you're one of the top people agents need to talk to as far as working that. in the industry. Thank you. Yes. Hear that, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so if someone wanted to interview with you, come talk to you about uh, the company and uh, work under you, what's the best number or email for them to do that? Uh, they can do it at r.mints at ggsir.com. And they can call me anytime, 925 872 zero nine six eight perfect i answer all well i don't answer but i will definitely call you back very quickly i make myself very available awesome for anyone ron thank you for being on the podcast thank again. you this was great yeah i appreciate it thank you so much for listening to the podcast thank you to our producer sam lemon please subscribe like comment and share the podcast remember you can listen to the podcast on itunes Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day -day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. Check out our sponsors, and I'll catch you on the next episode.